Welcome to New Economic Thinking. We're here with Professor Tanya Singer. Welcome. What is New Economic Thinking to you? Uh, so it's basically <laughs> it's an institution where um, I have a project with. So that's for me. I'm a neuroscientist and psychologist, so I'm not an economist. And so I'm working on new economic thinking as a psychologist and neuroscientist, trying to bring the knowledge we have in our field into economics. That's really the goal of this joint project with Dennis Noor uh, in INET. So that's... So for a long time, um, there was no projection of, of the kind of work that you or the background that you're coming from into the field of economics. What do you think has changed now? Yeah, I mean, it's still very slow. I think for in terms of the importance it has, you know, economy is about humans and about interaction between humans. And so I'm still puzzled that, you know, economy could not have talked to psychology and other disciplines for so long. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm aware that obviously a lot of people have talked already to psychology, so the whole field of, of behavioral microeconomics is in a way a talk or a rediscovery of psychology for economics. Kahneman and Tversky, they are psychologists, they got a Nobel Prize yeah. on that. So uh, it's not something which just emerged yesterday, but from what I can see, macroeconomic models and macroeconomy has not talked at all to psychology so far. That's at least my reading of, of the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm puzzled because it's so important. <laughs> right. I, I think the knowledge which psychology has um, yeah, derived since centuries is really important for economy and should enter economic model. So how do you think that economic models can best be Im improved through the use of psychology? Can we quantify things that we need in order to introduce them into models, or is this just a qualitative change? Uh, so I think there are multiple steps. I think first it would be important for economists to understand psychology so that they can uh, reform uh, the picture of human nature they have. So we are working, for example, in the INET project, how to replace the picture of homo economicus, which from a psychological point of view is just not... Uh, it's just you can't hold it anymore. It's, right. I mean, almost every axiom which I've heard which are associated to the notion of neoclassicistic notion of homo economicus is wrong, right. just purely wrong from a psychological perspective. So before you start modeling or deriving new models, you should probably just deconstruct the old, and this is what we started doing. So, uh, you know, like talking about preferences, replacing them with motivational system, uh, you know, questioning the assumption that preferences are fixed, mm -hmm. exogenously given by some, you know, like you are born with something, it, not, it doesn't change over a lifetime, it's stable. You always want the same thing. You know, you always want the same thing, irrespective of whether you just woke up, you, you know, whether you are in your 20s, in the 50s, in your 60s, you know, we, in psychology we know about lifetime changes, but also depending on which motivational system is most active in a certain context, you will have very different preferences or a priority of different preference functions. And so we are starting to first decompose all the axiomatic <laughs> of neoclassicistic homo economicus view by really um, citing also empirical research, so psychological experiments, mm -hmm. neuroscientific experiments, which just prove on an empirical basis the wrongness of these claims. And then the second step is to derive a new model, a new realistic model of human nature. And then the third step will be to derive mathematical, um, a mathematical formulation of this model. And that's certainly much more difficult than what has been done so far. And I'm not saying it's a thing, I think, which can be done in a year. Right, right. <laughs> I think this will take time because it's more or less... Yeah, you have to derive a new model, I think, a complete right. new paradigm. It's interesting because when Homo economicus was first devised as a theory, mm -hmm. many of the people that, that wrote about it or that started it and supported it in the beginning knew that it was limited. Mm -hmm. Be but that's the best that they could do with exactly. the available tools of the time. Exactly. But I think there was a time in which um, the belief in the system as such was, was made more rigid. And they forgot that actually the, the beginning, yes. in the beginning they understood that all motivations were not like that. And yes. yet the profit maximizing individual was sort of assumed to be all constant. 
Yes. And unfortunately, now you see that there's a sort of a different path, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely aware also that it's quite difficult uh, to come up with feasible macroeconomic models. So yeah. I wouldn't want to do that right, myself, exactly. you know. So I'm a psychologist, neuroscientist focusing on an individual. But uh, also, I'm a social neuroscientist and a social psychologist. And so we also... Uh, study a lot uh, the importance of groups, of identities, of social groups, of in-group, out-group. And even these things, these entities of groups have not been really uh, incorporated in macroeconomic model. Macroeconomic model is just uh, there is homo economicus, an individual, and then you put it onto a macro scale. But there is nothing in the layer in between which would account for something like group identity, um, you know, social psychology, in-group, out-group discrimination, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, emotional contagion among groups. Uh, but those are all things that in this field of psychology have been established for a long time, and yet they were not transferred exactly. over. Exactly. They were, they were just not read, I don't know right. uh, why. <laughs> Perhaps it was not. I, I, I can imagine that because it is so difficult to track mathematically right. uh, uh, a model which we are coming up with is a model where you have different contexts and depending on the context, different motivational system of you can be activated. So you can at some point be very achievement, power motivated and the next hour you go home, you know, your child is kind of, hey, papa, you know, with big eyes in your whole care system is activated exactly. and you will show a complete different objective of, of behavior. In one case, you will be much more altruistic for social, perhaps, uh, if you are you know, two hours before working in a bank without any ethical <laughs> uh, context, you might just you know, be uh, interested in self-interest and in maximizing your boni without any you know, other regarding preferences in your utility function. But you are the very same person, and that's the important thing. You are the very same person. You not have just one fixed preference. One hour later, your preference completely changed and another utility function is exactly. coming online and is deciding how you will behave. And so what we are trying is to see what are the contexts, the conditions, the institutions which foster which motivation so that we can then understand what is the best context to have to, for example, foster global cooperation, sustainability, yeah. uh, instead of just fast choices, you know, temporary discounting problems. We know that in the economy, you know, how to overcome that, how to move people to a global cooperator instead of just being locally interested in cooperation with kins or, you know, like in-group members. That's so these... a really fascinating area of, of research, and we're very happy that INET is supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, how would you define for our audience um, what a motivation is mm -hmm. and how that differs from what an emotion is? So, you know, a motivation and emotion are very close and it's very often confounded, but yeah. perhaps let me give you an example. Motivations are very much more fundamental and they have an evolutionary purpose. I mean, a lot of emotions too, but in emotions research, you can sometimes have in some cultures 3,000 emotion words. Motivations are much more fundamental. So, for example, we distinguish between seven, like achievement, consumption, you know, this is an evolutionary survival goal. It's like you have to eat, you would die if you wouldn't have that. Care is an evolutionary survival thing too, because if you don't bring up your children, your genes will not perpetuate and human race will just be abolished. So care is really important. You need to be right. altruistic towards your children so they survive. So it's a very basic motivation and it comes with a certain goals and objectives which uh, organize your thinking, your perception, your actions. So it, there, there is an organizational principle to these motivation systems. So if you are care system is activated, you will see cues more rapidly which have to do with social cues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you will have approach behavior going, you know, like uh, helping. Uh, and so that is all inbuilt in our biology. This is a system which which is caring. Mm -hmm. Then if you are consumption seeking, you are much more self-focused. You want to have food for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, temporal discounting is not so good, you know, it's less thinking about the other than about yourself. Um, you will have a sensitivity to depict in your environment very quickly consumption cues, like food or smells mm -hmm. and so on. So you see how motivation systems right. organize in a way perception 
thinking, emotions, and action tendency. So they are more fundamental than and emotions. And that informs the different stages of your modeling or, exactly. or your preferences. So, for example, if you are motivated by power, it's not clear which emotion immediately comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Very often, probably anger, <laughs> you know, if you don't get what you want. But the power motivation in itself is a motivation to be com competitiveness is associated to that. It's like to, to, to have, you know, influence over people, um, to influence people. That's the power motive, too. So what is, um, when, when you think about compassion, and you've written about this, yes. um, what is the difference between compassion and empathy? So that's a very important difference, and most of the people get it wrong. Uh -huh. They think it's the same thing. They think, and I also thought that at the beginning, that this is a kind Before of a... Before re reading your work, I saw that. Yes, you saw the same. So, um, so in a way, you could say both are responses to the suffering of another. Mm -hmm. So both are social emotions which come up when someone is suffering and you react to it. Mm -hmm. But empathy is basically, you are suffering, I'm suffering with you. You are in pain, I feel your pain. And we can measure in the brain that networks in the brain are activated very, very fast and automatically, which code for my aversive feeling of pain if you are in pain. Mm -hmm. So we share the pain even in activation of neural network in the brain which are not so conscious. Absolutely. So that would be empathy. This is right. emotional resonance. You know, Even if you are happy, I can have empathic yeah. joy, right. and then I'm happy with you. If people start laughing in the room, everyone laughs, this would be an empathic mm -hmm. response in the positive sense. Now, compassion is a response to the suffering which is not suffering as well. I'm not in pain because you are in pain, not suffering because you're suffering, but I have this kind of love, this concern, this, this warm feeling of wanting to help and a very strong motivation. So it's not just an emotion, but it's a strong motivation so for your benefit. So you're it's coming. So how we conceive compassion is that it's originated out of the care system. So it comes really with wanting the welfare of the other and doing everything which is possible to optimize your welfare and to help you. So is that more action driven than, than, than the empathy? The empathy, can, yeah. empathy can, is in a way neutral. It can right. result into what we call empathic stress. Mm -hmm. So this means, for example, a lot of, uh, I think, doctors and nurses burn out because of empathic stress. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to transform it into compassion, into this kind of wholesome, resilient emotion of love in a way. Um, and, and so they just stuck in this empathic distress, which becomes very self-centered. Mm -hmm. And then they might even have negative reactions, you know, like what you know very often in couples, someone, you know, ah, oh, I hate you being stressed again. Right, right. You know, that's an empathic distress response. As opposed to the... But it leads to very antisocial <laughs> behavior. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm clapping the door going out, not helping yeah, you yeah, at yeah. all. So empathy is, is neutral. Is, it can go in all directions. And I wonder, is, um, is compassion in your research found to be uniquely human? Uh, we have not done compassion training in rats okay. so far because right. it's very difficult to study, so there are limits on how you can study it in animals. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what we know from microbiology is that the care system, affiliative system, mm -hmm. uh, which comes with neuropeptides of you know, oxytocin and a complicated chain between oxytocin, opiates, and dopamine, mm -hmm. uh, you can find that in rats and all other animals uh -huh. because also other animals need to care of their offspring, you know, they will also bite right. uh, aggressors from outside if their puppets are in danger. Mm -hmm. So the rudimentary ground of where compassion altruism comes from is this care system. Mm -hmm. I think that humans have the unique capacity to move from this kinship compassion, this kind of very biologically, you know, like Close. taking yeah. care of your kids, of your right. children, to more global compassion. So we are we are able to actually feel for people we don't even like or outgroup members or other nation or people we yeah. don't know. And that's a capacity where you need to expand the circle of compassion. And I think we, for doing that, we need um, circuitry in the brain which we don't share with all other animals. Uh, you know, we have to also regulate emotions to you know, not just have this spontaneous response yeah for our kids or children, but for people we might not even like. That's something more difficult. So one last question, because we're running out of time. <laughs> You've been very kind with your time. Um, what, what can we look forward to soon uh, from your research? So what's, when the first stage is done, 
Will you publish that? Will it be available um, on yes. INET so everybody can, can have a look? So we are, at the moment we are about to submit 100 page big review paper where we mm -hmm. first did the theoretical background of mm -hmm. reviewing motivation, psychology, behavioral economics, uh, neoclassicistic theory, neuroscience, biology and try to put it all together in a theoretical model. Right. And then in parallel we're working on economic papers which start uh, making simulation models about, uh, you know, how care and consumption as two motivation system can perpetuate, evolutionary speaking, in a, in a bigger society. So to go mm -hmm. from the micro to the macro. And we are preparing in parallel experiments where we would put you, for example, one week we would prime unconsciously your care system mm -hmm. and then put you through all these economic games and see how your behavior is. And then one week later, we prime you with power cues. And so your power activation unconsciously, your power motivation gets... To show the difference in the behavior. And then we want to show that you're the same person primed by care, sh shows more trust, shows more cooperation, less defection, you know, blah, blah. And then a week later, you're the same person, same lab, same games, same paradigm, but primed with power, show more competitive behavior. So, and this is a line of research we are uh, just, about, we're just doing, but it will take another year, or I don't know. That's <laughs> fantastic, and it's wonderful that <laughs> INET is supporting up. this. So thank you very much for your time, and we very much look forward to your research. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs>